Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Crypto Marketing Insights. I'm Yasha Harari. Bitcoin Apocalypse. What will you do when the global financial system resets? Today's talk is about Bitcoin, and it's how people commonly misunderstand it, and how it may very well save you when the worldwide economic network gets its long overdue reboot. And then we'll explore what you can do to be prepared, whatever the case may be. Bitcoin, for those of you who might be new to the space, is a global revolution. It is born in response to the corrupt financial system whose massive inflationary policies caused recessions and economic crashes, notably the dot-com bubble that crashed in 2000 and the infamous housing bubble and ensuing crash in 2008. Bitcoin was released onto the world at a time when the global economy was hurting badly and the cause of much of it was perceived by a number of cypherpunks that the system of global politics, which controls how fiat currency is created and controlled by a very small number of people in each country, and whose hands on the levers of power manifest in the money printing presses they control, are corrupt by the very fact that they are not subject to any form of public scrutiny and they are protected by the biggest guns in the land, in the state. And this is true in any state that issues its own currency or enforces the use of any fiat currency, even if not their own. Have no doubt about it. Bitcoin represents a direct threat to the established order of power, politics, and the purse of which the latter generally controls the most leverage over the first two. Bitcoin lets people send values, be they monetary or informational or otherwise, to anyone else without a third party in the middle. That means that barring any duress, no middleman, no government, no bank, no broker, no agent, no relay, no courier, no messenger, no censor, and no one and nothing can stand in the way of you sending your transaction to the person you want it to send to. Think about that. Bitcoin changes and drastically improves how facts can be recorded and verified for retrieval, research, archival, and historical purposes, among other. In other words, things that happen on the blockchain literally stay on the blockchain and can be seen for time immemorial as long as there is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is uncensorable and immutable. This makes it worth more than gold or any centralized bond, commodity, security, currency, or other asset because it ensures free speech on the blockchain. Right? No dollar you hold, no euro you hold, no yen, no yuan, no any other currency, no gold, no oil, no stocks, no Facebook shares, no Google shares, no YouTube shares, or well, YouTube shares, no Amazon shares, no Netflix shares. None of that can possibly guarantee your freedom of speech. But the blockchain can, at least on the blockchain. Bitcoin works as long as there is a network with power to support its computational needs. It does not need the internet to exist as Bitcoin runs on its own protocol. It just uses the internet as one convenient medium on which it can work, but it certainly is not limited to the internet and is already used offline 
on systems that are never on the internet in multiple systems and applications currently in use on earth. Bitcoin generally goes up in value because it is scarce and it has a limited supply of just 21 million Bitcoins that can never be added to in addition to that max supply. And of those 21 million, 18 million have already been mined and around three to six million are assumed to be lost or inaccessible, including one million that were mined by the pseudonymous creator of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, whose identity, whereabouts, and state of being remain a mystery and whose answers are likely to remain unknown, barring some unforeseen event that may shed light upon the facts. Yet the fact that the creator of Bitcoin remains actually unknown is frankly irrelevant. It has been shown that even if Satoshi were to come back and were to decide to dump all his Bitcoin, the market would be able to absorb that 4% hit. Maybe it would take a few days, weeks, or a couple months, but even if you dumped 4% onto the market, well, you know, that impact would be absorbed because the prices would drop, people would buy them, and the prices would go right back up again. And if you don't think that the price would drop significantly after such a huge dip, uh, well, you need to learn about markets. I'm definitely, uh, that's what happens, right? Price slippage. So also remember, the Bitcoin is the people's money, right? It is open source meaning anyone can see the code and participate in the code development community. Right? And, and that community is all just people and organizations who choose to be involved. And it is self-sustaining, at least so far, right? Now, Bitcoin is reliable with over 99.9% .9 uptime. And the only downtime there ever was was very early on in the still extremely experimental days when there was some major work done to the network for upgrades as it was being installed. And since then, it has just simply never been down and never failed, period. It has just, yeah, Bitcoin runs, it is up. Bitcoin is up, right? <laughs> um, Bitcoin is practically unhackable, right? While many exchanges and wallets have been hacked because poor security exposed passwords or people lost access because they were socially engineered out of access to their accounts and the hackers gained access, um, the actual Bitcoin network and blockchain has never been permanently compromised by a hack. Of course, there have been a few instances where Bitcoin security was vulnerable. Right. There was even a blockchain rollback once due to a code loophole that allowed one hacker to mine an astronomical number of Bitcoin before the mistake was stopped and rolled back. A couple of other instances uh, were exceptions to the rule. The latest one of significant happening as late as 2018 when a Bitcoin Cash developer found yet another mine all you want loophole in the Bitcoin code and then immediately alerted the Bitcoin core developers about the bug and together they quickly implemented a fix before it could be exploited. So very altruistic move there by a Bitcoin Cash developer who, you know, did the right thing. Um, and the community has shown over the years that uh, even with competing coins, as in this case, Bitcoin Cash, you know, uh, supported the efforts of Bitcoin to help them fix a significant bug. Obviously, there are many shared interests between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, but um, that is right there an example of how the critical security issues in Bitcoin have been exposed over the years and fixed. That said, Bitcoin today has grown ever stronger and the code has been scrutinized heavily. And the, and the hash rate that protects it and the backup plans that exist essentially in case any one party ever gained 51% control make it so that Bitcoin is 
practically unhackable today, and it will likely only become more so as time goes by and the network grows stronger as the blockchain grows longer. Merely the cost of doing a 51% attack hack would not be economically viable today. It would simply be cheaper for the hacker to actually buy Bitcoin or to mine it, and doing so at such a large scale would very likely increase the value of the Bitcoin if they were to buy it in large scale. As is what happens when there is a massive buying pressure on an asset that is traded on the markets, thus making a large purchase of Bitcoin a very valuable move indeed. But what would you do when the banks bust? We all saw how the markets freaked out this past week about the coronavirus and how that took a hit on Bitcoin and a much bigger one on the traditional markets, where a 10% drop in a price is a shock usually, let alone a 22.77 drop in prices as we saw in the past week on uh, traditional markets like SPY, SPX. Um, they were massively uh, hit by losses, just like specific stocks, uh, you know, Facebook, Apple, Google all saw red days, uh, but significant drops, right, far more than the usual, things they only see every couple years at best. And in fact, uh, it was, you know, <laughs> the worst week in a long time for those for the markets, right? So yes, Bitcoin is actually correlated to the stock market more than it is with gold. Anyone can see that with the correlation coefficient indicator that is freely available on the TradingView charting website. Uh, I pulled up that um, indicator thanks to a video I saw with uh, from Crown's Crypto Cave. If you're not familiar with his work, um, you should definitely look him up on YouTube. And uh, there's a, uh, a guy, Bali Poor, who makes amazing mathematical discoveries. Uh, and shares a lot of his indicators as well. And he's, uh, from what I know, to be the source of this correlation coefficient indicator. And it is quite telling. Uh, I don't know if he's the one who made that indicator, but he, he has pointed it out in recent discussions, which have been picked up by other uh, YouTubers, etc. So definitely take a look at the, the, uh, the, the correlation coefficient indicator on TradingView and see for yourself, is Bitcoin correlated to the stock markets? The answer is yes, very much. Maybe not as much as stock markets are correlated to each other, but certainly the big moves happen very much in parallel, even if they don't move in the same percentages, right? They still move together, um, generally speaking. Certainly more than Bitcoin moves together with gold. Right? That is a huge misnomer. Just take a look at that and you'll see for yourself. So, um, but that's good that it's not correlated 100% with gold and is actually more correlated with the market because, <clears throat> because there are more people who trade on the markets than there are people who just trade with gold. So if you actually want mass adoption, then it's good that the traditional markets um, trade more in sync with Bitcoin than just gold. Like nothing against gold, right? And a lot of gold bugs also love Bitcoin and vice versa. But the fact is that uh, gold is a little bit less correlated to Bitcoin's movement, which is actually good. Um, yet Bitcoin is, again, uh, Bitcoin is an asset that does not need the banks to run. Right? However, that's more of a kind of a visionary statement because it is true. It technically does not need the banks to run. However, it does need liquidity, right? And that means people have to buy in and they need to be able to buy it to do that. And that means that until people can use, you know, are using Bitcoin more than they're using their own currency, then that means that they're going to be using their own currency. And that means that banks and fiat are indeed necessary in order to convert fiat to Bitcoin, right? Because you need to hold the money somewhere. You're not going to buy everything immediately. You're not just going to throw all your money at Bitcoin. I mean, that would be utterly foolish, right? As much as 
I may love Bitcoin and I may tell you it's super important. I also won't tell you to put literally all of your eggs in one basket. And I also won't tell you to convert all of your last dollars to Bitcoin right now when dollars are still you know, far more in use than Bitcoin and euros are far more in use than Bitcoin, etc., etc. But you should have mechanisms in place that allow you to move your fiat to Bitcoin quickly and easily. And so for that, usually banks, bank accounts, accounts on Coinbase or Binance or any other place where you might buy crypto, those are all necessary, right? Um, so we cannot just pretend like crypto could just come along we could just make the banks just immediately disappear right that would be just i mean that's just foolish to think such a thing and also banks uh, serve an incredibly useful purpose even if bitcoinists might rail against them a lot of people find banks to be extremely convenient and they're willing to pay whatever the price is for the banks to manage their money even if it's costing them money right the, most people don't think about money in such terms so they don't really care if they lose one or two percent a year necessarily right i mean you might think they should and they probably should but that's just the fact i mean if it weren't the fact people would not keep their money in banks right they keep their money elsewhere but they do keep their money in banks because of the conveniences a lot of systems that they pay a lot of bills that they pay you know anything they have to pay to the state you know you need banks right <laughs> until they until they find a way to get around that uh, banks are still necessary and fiat is still necessary however what happens when the banks fail and you and everyone else can't get that fiat money out people who will want bitcoin will surely trade it for other things what will you trade for it right maybe you laugh now maybe you think oh i'm never going to need bitcoin that badly but maybe you won't laugh when you realize that you have little or no money left and what you have is worthless hyperinflated scam money from the world's biggest ponzi scheme fiat currency maybe you won't laugh so hard when you realize that bitcoin is software that is hard money and that it might literally save you when your fiat money won't the signs are everywhere the markets are on fire they've quite ominously had their worst week since the birth of bitcoin which in both cases were times of high tension in politics and a worldwide catastrophe. In 2008, the catastrophe was the housing bubble and collapse and all of the market meltdowns across the world which followed. And in 2020, it's the coronavirus which has transformed itself from a terrible illness into a health hazard of potentially global proportions, affecting largely economies and affecting countries which already have been nailed and hit by it and many of which are poorly equipped to handle it in any serious way thus leaving open the possibility of a prolonged outbreak and spread and in 2020 it's the coronavirus which has transformed itself from a terrible illness into a health hazard of potentially global proportions with most countries already being affected directly by it, and many of which are poorly equipped to handle it in any serious way, thus leaving open the possibility of a prolonged outbreak and spread. While it would likely take some years to get full FDA approval for an actual medicine that can help stave off future cases, outbreaks, and more importantly, help save lives. But of course, People should not panic and jump into pandemonium because of the coronavirus. Right? Quite frankly, uh, it has yet to demonstrate that it is um, so malevolent that most people cannot survive it. Right? Most people who contract it do survive it at this point in the data. Uh, and so the experts in the field are confident that it will not be some crazy pandemic that will melt down the entire world. However, 
markets tend to be much more reactionary to bad news than even the actual street. And there's reasons for that, right? At the market level, you can be a lot more sensitive to things and things can move a lot faster. On the street level, things might not actually impact you that quickly, right? Or at least they might not appear to be. So in this case, that is what we are seeing, right? And we're already seeing the writing on the wall since a couple of years now, in terms of the economy. Ever since Bitcoin reached its all-time highs in 2017, the US government and other governments have been aiming for it, gunning for it, largely ineffectively, though local routes, you know, local rules and regulations have of course been implemented and more are on the way. And obviously, you know, when Bitcoin hit its all-time high, oh, guess what? The CME futures of Bitcoin was opened up and people were allowed to short it for the first time. And then the price tanked, right? What a shocker. And then again last year when Bitcoin was having its little renewed bull run, the Treasury Secretary came out and said that people use Bitcoin for bad things, but no, nobody uses cash for bad things. And the utter hypocrisy of that is so telling about how the political system is scared and how the financial system is scared of orange coin, right? The little Bitcoin that could, little orange coin that could, Bitcoin. Um, yeah, we're seeing that. And the fact is also that uh, Bitcoin does not care about these laws, right? Only users of it in any given jurisdiction have to be concerned with their local laws and rules, just as anyone has to be so concerned wherever they are. Because again, the state controls its land and all the people with them, within them by force, which it ironically calls protection or defense. And uh, if anyone else offered such protection to you, you would say they are extorting you forcing you to pay for your own protection lest you fail to do so and have the very same protectors suddenly show up and break you and everyone you love and cherish and everything you own sounds scary i mean does that sound scary to you if you are scared well before you think it will never get to that before you stop and say hang on this is just sounds like ridiculous fear-mongering well it isn't because again before you think it will never get to that remember governments have been running this exact ruse on their subject and citizens for so long that most people aren't even aware of it it's not like you go to a public government funded or even a private non-funded school and they will teach you that the government is a scam and their money is the mother of all scams. And all those people who do not know that the system is a scam and all of those people who do know that the system is a scam of all of those people together, most of them have resigned themselves long ago to the notion that there is simply nothing that can be done about it. So they accept that they may as well swim in the stream rather than against it, even if swimming against it is better for their self-interest and goals and quality of life. So are you ready for the financial meltdown in a crypto-dominated future? Or do you still think crypto is a passing trend like social media, the web, email, the internet, TV, radio, and newspapers? I remember people saying to me, ah, this email thing, it's a joke, it's not gonna last. The web, huh, who's gonna watch, who's gonna read articles on the computer screen when I can just open a newspaper? Who wants to listen to audio when I can just turn on the radio? Who wants to watch TV, you know, who wants to watch videos on the web when I can just turn on TV? All right? Do you remember those days? I remember them. So what can you do if you need to prepare? As always, this is not financial advice. I'm not your financial advisor. Do your own research. These are just my opinions. Buy Bitcoin.
you can buy a variety of the top performing crypto coins. You don't just have to buy Bitcoin. You, know, you can get a basket of them. They even offer them in baskets. And you can just hold them for a period of years because the data shows if you hold your crypto for years at a time, the likelihood is you will get significant returns on your investment. Depends which crypto is, of course, but if you go with Bitcoin, well, the likelihood is you'll see nice returns. <clears throat> Maybe you won't see another 100x, but you might see a 2, 3, 4, 5, 10x. Maybe you won't see uh, another Bitcoin come along with, you know, going from zero to $9,000 and $10,000 and $20,000. But maybe you can, you know, get a coin that's a few pennies and might go up to 50 cents, a dollar, who knows, right? Uh, maybe you can get some Ethereum. Maybe you can get some Litecoin. Maybe you can get some whatever it is that you believe are the good cryptocurrencies that have what you think are best for you. If it's a proper cryptocurrency that's actually decentralized, like Bitcoin, and there aren't many that are, but... Bitcoin, let's say Monero, which also has the privacy function, which is also incredibly valuable. Um, there is a strong use case, a enormous use case, looming right around the corner. Right? And to ignore that fact would just be bad. It would be detrimental to your own self-interest. And that's why you should remember, while financial planners, investment analysts, and talking heads of all stripes have long been advocating for anyone to put about 1% of their portfolio into crypto and blockchain projects, notably they talk about Bitcoin, but sometimes they mention Ethereum or other things. But if you put about 1% <clears throat> into your portfolio uh, into crypto, then others in the crypto space, you know, uh, are saying actually 1% may be a little too little because the returns on 1%, while they may be good, if you just put in 2 or 3%, you're likely not to be hurt badly still if it goes completely wrong and tanks. But on the other hand, if you double or triple the returns that you would have gotten, for that tiny investment, that could be phenomenal. And so far over the past 11 years, Bitcoin and other leading cryptos have delivered amazing results if you held them long enough and sold them at the right time. And that's why it's important to remember, um, really, don't look at the price chart and think to yourself, oh, Bitcoin's going down. Everyone's in a panic. Coronavirus. Gotta sell, sell, sell. Don't fool yourself. This is precisely the moment you need to be thinking to yourself and looking at the market and saying, what is the smart money doing right now? Because you know what happens when there's blood on the streets, right? You know who comes along and buys all the stuff, right? You know it doesn't just sit there forever and no one picks it up at bargain basement prices, right? Discounted goods get bought quickly. If you don't believe me, look at what happens on Black Friday every year at your local shopping mall. Discounted prices get bought quickly. And Bitcoin right now, <clears throat> whether you believe it's at a, you know exact low or not, Bitcoin to me, is much more than the price action on the charts. You don't have to own a whole Bitcoin to participate in Bitcoin, right? Remember, you can buy Satoshis, which is a part of a Bitcoin. There's a hundred million Satoshis in every one Bitcoin, right? So if you even own just a million Satoshis, which is like about a hundred bucks right now, 85 bucks right now, $85 and change, depending where you're buying it, right? You get a million Satoshis for 85 bucks. Do you know what you can do with a million Satoshis? I'm not talking about the money, right? You can actually store information on the blockchain forever with your million Satoshis. 
Do you understand that? It, it may seem trivial to you, but let's say you're a historian, or let's say you're working for some uh, you know, group at the UN, and you've been sent on a mission to discover archaeological facts for a historical site. And you tag those things and you put them and you put that information on the Bitcoin blockchain. Do you understand how valuable it is to tag something with a transaction on the blockchain, a historical fact, and then to be able to retrieve that fact whenever you want for the rest of history without there ever being any way for someone to come along and corrupt what you wrote or intended to mean? You could be very specific and very clear, and no one can ever change that fact. There has never been a thing that could withstand the perils of time to corrupt information like history and facts about history. This is the closest thing we've ever gotten to it. Cryptocurrency, blockchain, Bitcoin, right? This allows the world to be much more accountable. It doesn't just allow it, it encourages it and makes it possible and it works. And the more people participate in these kind of public ledgers, the better record we will have of things for time immemorial, not just for our puny little lives in this grand scheme of things but for generations to come, historians and archivists and archaeologists who want to understand how human beings evolved from a species that used fiat currency into one that used cryptocurrency, from a species that evolved, from a people that evolved, and civilization that evolved from using centralized, corrupt mechanisms to control their wealth, their power, their politics, their interests, their cultures, and everything, to a system that opened itself up and said statism and anti-statism and all that politics is defunct and corrupted and we are moving away from it and public ledgers that are distributed are one of the key ways to make that change happen in society and in civilization around the world and even beyond the actual terrestrial surface itself because believe it or not Bitcoin and crypto can work in outer space. And not only that, well, they obviously do. Because when you send satellite transmissions with Bitcoin from one person to another, well, Bitcoin's already in outer space. So, so that's it, folks. Stay prepared. Do what you have to do. Don't miss this boat. All right? If you want to know what you should do, well, I can't tell you what to do because everybody has their own context. But I can tell you that personally, I am bullish on Bitcoin, not because of the price. I don't care about the price. Really, I don't. What I care about is the utility of this technology, which can make the world better and make humanity better. That, to me, is worth far more than any currency or any asset or any price that you could throw at me. I value my freedom more than my finances. And anybody who doesn't, doesn't understand the potential disastrous consequences of trading the latter for the former. And frankly, anyone who'd be willing to trade their freedom for finance doesn't deserve either. So on that note, and having borrowed from one of the founding fathers of the United States, I want to wish you all well, and I want to say thank you again for listening. I hope this has been insightful to you. I hope you've learned something if you're new to this space, even if you're not. And that if there's anyone you think should know about this, by all means, feel free to share it with them. Pass it along with them now. And, uh, yeah, that's going to do it for now, folks. So, till next time, take care. <laughs>